Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. Guys, first things first, don't forget to like and subscribe to this channel. Make sure you press that little notification button that looks like a bell. That's the button that lets you know every time that I upload a new video. So on this video, I'm going to be covering Noro. And as always, most of my videos have to have a part two because there's just so much material to cover. So this is definitely part one of Noro. Without fur any further ado, let's get started. First question. An 18-year-old client admitted with a closed head injury sustained in an MVA. His intracranial pressure shows an upward trend. Which intervention should the nurse perform first? One, reposition the client to avoid neck flexion. Two, administer a one gram of mannitol as ordered. Three, increase the ventilator's respiratory rate to 20 breaths per minute. D, administer 100 milligrams of phenobarbital IV as ordered. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. Okay, guys, if you're new to this channel, I know sometimes I might go very, um, very quickly, and that's just because I'm trying to cover as much material as possible. But if I'm going too fast, you need more time to think of your question or your answer, just press that pause button. That's all you guys have to do. So guys, the correct answer is number one, reposition the client to avoid neck flexion. Now, why is that the very first thing that we need to do? Well, guess what? Neck flexion will increase a client's um, intracranial pressure, right? So you might just need to do that simple thing to get it to go back down. So before you worry about trying to, let's see what our other choices were. Um, giving mannitol. I'm going to, um, mannitol guys is a type of diuretic. It helps decrease pressure, um, before worrying about, um, increasing respiratory rate or giving phenobarbital, phenobarbital, um, is an anti-epileptic so a patient doesn't get seizures. Before you worry about all of that, the simple act of repositioning the patient can be enough to bring down that pressure. Remember, patient with um, increased intracranial pressure, do we want their head flexed? No. Do we want it hyperextended? No. Do we want it laterally rotated? No. We want their head in what? A neutral position. Straight, aligned, neutral position. Okay, let's talk about some other things that increases a patient's intracranial pressure since we happen to be talking about ICP. Coughing, sneezing, bearing down, suctioning. All of those can increase, matter of fact, even moving a patient. How about that, right? So all of those can increase a patient's intracranial pressure. Remember guys, in nursing, we always want to go from least invasive to most invasive. So if you can do something as simple as repositioning a patient to bring down that ICP, that's going to be the first thing you're going to do. Remember, in nursing medicine, we go from least invasive to most invasive. So that's why number one is your correct answer. Number two, a client with a subarachnoid hemorrhage is prescribed a thousand milligram loading dose of Dilantin IV. Which consideration is important when administering this dose? One, the therapeutic level should be maintained between 20 and 30. Two, rapid dilantin administration can cause cardiac arrhythmias. Three, dilantin should be mixed in dextrose in water before administration. Or four, dilantin should be administered through an IV catheter in the client's hand. And guys, the correct answer is two. Rapid administration of Dilantin can cause cardiac arrhythmias. Um, anything more than 50, 50 milligrams, okay? So you don't want to give it rapidly, and you have to be very careful. Anything that's ordered more than 50 milligrams, you're going to give it especially slow, okay? Um, let's talk about these other choices because I know I talked to you about what's right, but you need to know why the other choices are wrong. Choice one. Therapeutic levels should be maintained between 20 and 30. No, they shouldn't. Your therapeutic range is 10 to 20 for um, Dilantin, and you need to know that. The, the, um, this range is one of the ranges that you absolutely necessarily must know for Dilantin. 10 to 20. Okay, so what happens is if the patient's blood level of Dilantin, they need the Dilantin, you check their blood, and it's less than 10, they're getting a sub therapeutic level. 
okay? And that puts them at risk for what? Possible seizures. If it's more than 20, they're getting what? A toxic level, okay? So we wanna make sure that we keep it between 10 and 20. Choice three, Dilantis should be mixed in, de in dextrose with water before administration. No, you don't. You do not mix Dilantin with anything. You hear me? Look at me in my eyeball when I tell you this. You don't mix Dilantin with anything, okay? Number four, Dilantin should be administered through an IV catheter in the client's hand. Absolutely not. Dilantin um, can cause purple glove syndrome. You want to make sure that you put it in a big vein. So you might want to put it in the antecubital space, but you definitely don't want to put it um, in little small vessels such as the hand. Number three, or the next question, a client with head trauma develops a urine output of 300 milliliters per hour, dry skin, dry mucous membranes. Which of the following nursing interventions is most important to perform initially? One, evaluate urine-specific gravity. Two, anticipate treatment for renal failure. Three, provide emollients to the skin to prevent skin breakdown. Four, slow down the IV fluids and notify the physician. And I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. So guys, the correct answer is one, evaluate specific gravity, okay? Add pie, the first thing you're gonna do is what? Assess. Now I wanna go back to this question so I can pinpoint to the clues that they gave you. You're an output of 300 mLs per hour. So this patient's like a urinating all over the place. Dry skin. Well, I'd be dry if I was getting rid of all my fluids such as that. Dry mucous membranes. What's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to check the specific gravity because you're supposed to suspect with those symptoms that they just gave you, your mind is supposed to go to diabetes insipidus. Remember diabetes insipidus? I told you that's the disease that's like Oprah. That You know how Oprah's always giving things away? In diabetes insipidus, the body's just giving away the urine. You get urine. You get urine. You get... Everybody gets urine. Okay? So the patient is getting rid of all their urine because they're lacking what? Antidiuretic hormone. ADH is what helps you hold on to all of your fluids, right? But if you don't have enough ADH, you're doing what? Letting it all go, okay? So the patient with um, diabetes insipidus has increased urine output, but decreased antidiuretic hormone. Guess what else they also have? When you check their urine specific gravity, even though the urine output is high, the specific gravity is going to be what? Low. Okay. And that patient who's urinating all over the place that has diabetes insipidus, they're going to show signs and symptoms of dehydration because they're getting rid of all their fluids. So let's look at these choices, the other uh, choices. So I want to explain to you why they're wrong. You have to anticipate the treatment for renal failure. There's no evidence of that. Matter of fact, that patient, that, uh, excuse me, kidney is working just fine. This patient's urinating 300 mLs an hour. And we know when the kidneys are in trouble, what do they do? They shut down, okay? So if the kidneys were in trouble, we would see um, a urine output of less than 30 mLs per hour not more than 300. We don't have any evidence of this problem with the kidneys. Those kidneys are ju working just fine. Look at how much the patient is urinating. So that cannot be the answer. Then you have choice three, provide emollients to the skin to prevent skin. Who cares? Who cares about that skin breakdown when the patient's losing all their fluids? Okay. Remember those, that list I gave you of the priority patients, right? Those patients that fall under physiological integrity. Well, guess what? Was skin breakdown part of it? No. You want to know what was on that list? Fluid and electrolytes that this patient obviously is losing through their urine. So we don't care about the skin. Matter of fact, the skin breakdown is because the patient is so dehydrated from losing fluids, right? So the patient, we fix that problem. They hold on to their fluids. Guess what? The skin holds on to the moisture, okay? So right now, we don't even care about that skin breakdown. That is not a priority for us. Four, 
slow down the IV fluids and notify the doctor. Wow. So you have a patient that's urinating over 300 mLs per hour. They're exhibiting signs of dehydration and you're going to slow down the rate? No. Those patients that have diabetes insipidus, they need lots of fluids, okay? You are not going to be restricting their fluids because you need to replace all of those fluids and electrolytes that they're losing through the urine. And this is how they try to trick you because the last half of that choice said call the doctor. You suspect diabetes insipidus? Yes, you do need to call the doctor. But you have to assess them first because when you call the doctor, what are you going to tell them? Okay, so you have to assess them first, which includes getting that urine-specific gravity to give that to the doctor. And no, you are not going to restrict fluids. You are not going to, excuse me, decrease the IV. That patient needs to replace those fluids. So the correct answer is one, evaluate urine-specific gravity. When evaluating an ABG from a client with a subdural hematoma, the nurse notes that the part um, PaCO2 is 30 which of the following responses best describes this result? One, it's appropriate. Lowering the carbon dioxide reduces the intracranial pressure. Two, emergent. The client is poorly oxygenated. Three, normal. Or four, significant. The client has alveolar hypotension. I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. All right, guys, so the correct answer is one. It's appropriate. Lowering the CO2 reduces, intra, um, reduces intracranial pressure. And let me explain to you why. Well, before I explain to you why, let's make sure that you know your CO2 level because you absolutely must know it, okay? So it's 35 to 45. Anything higher than 45 will normally throw a patient into acidosis and less alkal alkalosis, okay? Carbon dioxide, uh, sometimes I call it carbon diacid, right? Because carbon dioxide is acidic. With Its nature within itself is acidic. It's supposed to be 35 to 45. And we see in this question that it's 30. Well, Professor D, 30 is less than our range of 35 to 45. Yes, that's true but let me tell you why it's appropriate for this type of patient. When you go back to the question, it says that the client has a sub sub subdermal hematoma. So if any patient that has bleeding in the brain, what one of the, our concerns is increased intracranial pressure, right? So we're gonna do everything that we can to lower that pressure. Well, did you know that carbon dioxide causes vasodilation? Which means the more CO2 that that patient holds on to, the more vasodilation that happens, the more what? Pooling that happens in the brain. So that's why um, it's appropriate to lower that CO2, which helps lower that vasodilation, which helps lower that ICP. Okay, so in normal circumstances, we do want that CO2 to be between 35 and 45, but when we're dealing with patient with potential for intracranial pressure, or they already have intracranial pressure, we do want to lower that uh, CO2 just to lower that pressure. So the choices two, three, or four are all wrong. Remember, this patient is at risk for increased intracranial pressure because of that bleeding in the brain. A client who's had a transphenoidal hypophysectomy should be watched carefully for hemorrhage, which may be shown by which of the following signs? One, bloody drainage from the ears. Two, a frequent swallowing. Three, a guaiac positive stools. Four, hematuria. Two, Frequent swallowing, guys. So, guys, they get up through the brain, either through that nose or through the mouth. That's how they get up to the brain, okay? Transphenoidal. So, if you see that patient frequently swallowing, what do you think they're swallowing? Blood. 
blood. Just like if a patient had a tonsillectomy and you see them frequently swallowing, you better be worried that they're what? Bleeding out what they're swallowing blood, okay? Bloody drainage from the ears. Why would there be drainage from the ears? That's not even how they get into the brain. Three and four, blood in the stools or blood in the urine. Why? Okay, how are they getting through the brain? Up here, okay? So when you see them swallowing, that's the blood from up here when they were trying to get to the brain that they're um, swallowing. And so if you suspect that, of course, you're gonna ask for, um, you're gonna ask the doctor to write an order to draw blood so you can see what that H and H is, right? Because when you see that hemoglobin going down, you know that patient's possibly what? Bleeding out. After a hypophysectomy, vasopressin is given IM for which of the following reasons? One, to treat growth failure. Two, to prevent syndrome of in inappropriate antidiuretic hormone. Three, to reduce cerebral edema and lower intracranial pressure. Or four, to replace antidiuretic hormone normally secreted by the pituitary gland. Okay, guys, the correct answer is four, to replace antidiuretic hormone normally secreted by the pituitary. Okay, so you guys got to remember what is in the pituitary, antidiuretic hormone, right? So that's what makes you not get rid of all your fluids and go into dehydration, right? So... When that pituitary gland's removed, so is the ADH. That's where the antidiuretic hormone is located. So guess what? That patient has to get an exogenous source. Otherwise, they go into what? Diabetes insipidus where they're urinating all over the place. So the patient gets an IM injection of vasopressin, presses everything in, keeps you from releasing it, right? They get an IM injection of vasopressin so that they don't lose all their fluids and they don't um, go into fluid and electrolyte imbalance. Remember, once that pituitary gland is gone, so is your antidiuretic hormone and the patient's going to have to have an exogenous source or guess what? They're going to end up dying, okay? They're going to be dehydrated to the point that um, they're kidneys, their organs, every single organ in the body, they go into hypovolemic shock because they're not getting enough oxygen, vitamin, nutrients that are in the blood. They're not getting enough of that and the organs start to shut down. So let's talk about the other answers and why they're wrong. You have number one, to treat growth hormone. Vasopressin does not, uh, I just gave you an answer. To treat growth failure. Vasopressin does not treat growth failure. Growth hormone does, okay? If the patient's having growth hormone, um, growth failure, they'll get growth hormone. Two, to prevent SIADH. SIADH, guys, is the opposite of diabetes insipidus. So on one hand, you have diabetes insipidus where they're urinating, they're getting rid of all their fluids, okay, because they don't have enough ADH. Well, SIADH is the opposite where they're holding on to all of their fluids. This patient has too much antidiuretic hormone, too much ADH, okay? So when you had the patient on this side with diabetes insipidus that was getting rid of all of their fluids, they were going into dehydration. The urine-specific gravity was little, but the urine output was high. On this end, the complete opposite is SIADH where antidiuretic hormone is too high and the urine output is too low. So the patient's going into what? Fluid overload because they're holding on to too much fluid. And their urine specific gravity is what? High. Okay? So they are the complete opposite and it's very important that you guys understand the difference between diabetes insipidus and SIADH. You got to know um, the difference in urine specific gravity. You have to know the difference in urine output and you have to know those adverse effects. All right. 
if you don't remember, just press rewind and watch this because I promise you guys, you guys are going to get questions on it and you absolutely must understand what goes up and what goes down in diabetes. Oh, one more thing you have to know between the difference of the two, the treatment. So in diabetes insipidus, where they're urinating all over the place and getting rid of all their fluids, you want to do what? Give them fluids, lots of fluids. You do not want to restrict fluids with this type of patient. But then in SIADH, which is the opposite, they're holding on to all their fluids. They're not urinating at all. And if they are, it's just a little bit, right? They're going into fluid overload. That type of patient, you want to restrict fluids. Yeah, because they already have too much, okay? And they're not getting rid of it. We don't need to give them more. So do that type of patient, you restrict fluids. So you, make sure you guys know that. A client comes to the ER after hitting his head in an MVA. He's alert and oriented. Which of the following nursing interventions should be done first? One, assess full range of motion to determine extent of injuries. Two, call for immediate chest x-ray. Three, immobilize the client's head and neck. Four, open the airway with a head tilt chin lift maneuver. All right, guys, so the correct answer is one. You want to immobilize the client's head and neck. It says in the question that the client hit his head in a motor vehicle accident. So until it has been determined that there is no injury to that cervical spine, you want to make sure that you immobilize the head and neck because you don't want to be the one to cause that patient to be paralyzed. Okay, so until they do x-ray, they make sure there is no fracture, there's no injury to that spine, that cervical column, you better immobilize that area. Let's look at our other choices. One, ass <laughs> assess full range of motion to determine the extent of injuries. Never, never until it is confirmed that there is no Fracture to the side. You are not going to be doing range of motion. You could be the one to paralyze that patient. Don't you dare. Okay? You can cause them to get a neck fracture. Two, call, an, uh, call for an immediate x-ray. Don't play doctor. That's totally out of your scope of practice. You can call the physician and ask the physician for an order. Right? And I... But you never write that order. You can't write that order as an RN, okay? Matter of fact, I wouldn't even call the doctor saying, can I get uh, um, an x-ray of the head or neck? That's the doctor's job. They're going to let you know. As soon as that patient comes in, they're going to order it. Now, if you notice you don't see an order yet, you can call up the physician and say, hey, you know, I'm going through the order and orders and I have not seen one for an x-ray. And just say it like that. And, you know, maybe the doctor was playing golf. You never know. They'll be like, oh, oh, maybe I forgot it. Okay, here's the verbal order. All right? But you cannot play doctor. Do not go out of your scope of practice. Four, open the airway with head tilt chin lift. No. You're not tilting that head at all. Okay? You are immobilizing that head. You're making sure that that head and the neck does not move at all. And guess what? There's no reason. Why are you doing... um? Um, head, head, chill, live. Why are you opening up the airway? It says right here that the patient is alert and oriented. The only way you know they're oriented is if you ask them questions and you know that they know who they are, they know what time it is, they know where they are, which means what? They're breathing. They're breathing. So what, what are you opening up their airway for? So your priority for this patient, again, you want to immobilize the head and the neck. A 23-year-old client's been hit on the head with a baseball bat. The nurse notes clear fluid draining from his nose and ears. Which of the following nursing interventions should be done first? One, position the client flat in bed. Two, check the fluid for dextrose with a dipstick. Three, suction the nose to maintain airway patency. 
four, insert nasal and ear packing with sterile gauze. All right, so the correct answer, guys, is two. Check fluid for dextrose with a dipstick. So that fluid that's draining from the nose and the ears, why are we checking it for sugar, for glucose? Because if it's positive for glucose, that lets us know that that patient has a um, cerebral spinal fluid leak, okay? So that fluid, so the cerebral spinal fluid, that fluid that's in your skull, right? That's what keeps your brain floating. It keeps your brain floating in your skull instead of what? Bumping against your skull, just bumping, 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 right? So that's what keeps your brain nice and floating. But if that patient has a leak, as that leak continues, your the patient's brain can possibly what? Herniate, okay? There can be all types of brain damage, okay? So we're going to check it for glucose. And if it's positive, OMG, we're calling the doctor right away saying, hey, you know, it's positive for glucose. That's how we know that this patient has a cerebral spinal fluid leak, okay? And another way you can know that is you might get a question that uh, the patient, same, same situation, but let's say you don't have a dipstick. What are you going to do? This, you can take a gauze and just put it um, right under the, that mustache area or the ear where it's drainage, draining. And if you see a yellow ring that comes around that leak, that yellow ring is the glucose. And that's what lets you know that the... Um, that is cerebral spinal fluid that's um, leaking. And again, you're going to call the physician. Let's look at our other choices so you can know why they're wrong. You have number one, position the client flat in bed. No, flat is going to increase, increase um, pressure in their head. You do not do that. Okay. Two, uh, we have two, three, suction the nose to maintain airway patency. Well, you know that is not the answer because maybe two or three questions ago when I was telling you all of the things that can increase a patient's, um, in, um, I can't speak today, intracranial pressure, one of the things I told you was what? Suctioning. So we are not going to be suctioning their nose. And then another reason we're not going to be suctioning their nose, if you go back to the question, it says that they were hit in the head with a baseball bat. So there might possibly be some kind of basilar fracture, frac fracture. I can't speak, guys. I'm sorry. There might be some kind of basilar fracture. So when there, we even suspect a basilar fracture, we never put anything in their nose or anything in their mouth. Okay. And then four, oh, I gave you the answer, number four. Four, insert uh, nasal and ear packing with sterile gauze. Absolutely not, okay? They got hit in the head. We don't know if they have a basal or fracture. We're not putting anything anywhere on their face. Which of the following clients on the rehab unit is most likely to develop Autonomic dysreflexia. One, a client with a brain injury. Two, a client with a herniated nucleus pulpus, pulposus. Three, a client with high cervical spine injury. Four, a client with a stroke. And guys, the correct answer is three, the client with high cervical spine injury. Anything T10 or higher, the rest, that's your chest area, okay? Anything T10 or higher, that increases your risk for spinal cord, spinal cord injury, for autonomic dysreflexia. By the way, guys, autonomic dysreflexia, this is a medical emergency. You suspect autonomic dysreflexia, you're calling the doctor. There's other measures that you're going to do. We're going to talk about this um, in a little bit, but this is a medical emergency. All right. Why? With autonomic dysreflexia, you have um, 
abundance of your SNS, okay? Your sympathetic nervous system is just going into overdrive. Now, if you watched my videos before, you know what that SNS does. That S in sympathetic means to speed up. So guess what? That patient's heart rate is speeding up to the point that they could have an arrhythmia. Their blood pressure is speeding up to the point that they can have a stroke, okay? So this is a medical emergency. We do not play with autonomic dysreflexia. So, but you have to know what would place a patient at risk in any cervical spine injury, especially a high one, thoracic, your T10 or higher will place a patient at risk. One, two, and four are not risk factors for autonomic dysreflexia. All right, last question, guys. Which of the following conditions indicates that spinal shock is resolving in the client with a C7 quadriplegia? One, the absence of pain sensation in the chest. Two, spasticity. Three, spontaneous respirations. Or four, urinary incontinence, excuse me, urinary continence. Okay, guys, and the correct answer is two, spasticity. Why? That spasticity lets us know the reflexes are returning. They're coming back, all right? Don't forget spinal shock. That word shock, if you watch my cardio video, you know what that is, right? So everything's gone down. The blood pressure, down. The heart rate, down. This patient's going through having what? Paralysis. They're having no reflexes at all. So the fact that we see spasticity, spasticity lets us know that those reflexes are finally returning our other choices one three and four they're not even related to spinal shock okay so remember guys in spinal shock where the patient's going through paralysis and everything's just going down the heart rate's going down the blood pressure's going down patients basically paralyzed we have no reflexes at all we know that they're starting to recover once we do see spasticity and we start to see those reflexes returning guys i hope this video was helpful to you um i love and appreciate the comments the words of encouragement guys because i work full time and i really squeeze out the time to make these videos so i really appreciate those words of encouragement and i'm going to keep it coming because what I want to do for you is make your life easier in the nursing program and just teach you things that I wish I was taught when I was a nursing student. So guys, if you appreciate this video, please support this channel by subscribing, pressing that notification button so you can know when more videos are out so you can watch them and of course giving me that thumbs up. Thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time.